Um, thank you very much, Simone, for uh, kindly introducing me. Uh, this is Makoto Yokohari uh, speaking from Tokyo. Uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate Simone uh, Mikeda and all the organizers of uh, this wonderful ses um, uh, session and also the wonderful conference. I I'm really, really uh, happy to be here to give some um, experiences which we have in Japan. Okay, so from here on, I would like to um, share my uh, slide. There we go. Oops, excuse me. It's coming. There it is. Yep. Maybe you can go full screen. Yep. Can you see it now? Okay. Well, uh, today I would like to talk about cooler cities and feel cooler cities. Now, uh, first of all, uh, you may already have seen this uh, graph, but this graph was illustrated by the World Economic Forum back in 2019, uh, just before uh, this uh, COVID pandemic started. And uh, in this uh, graph, um, the World Economic Forum has been um, ex um, explaining what kind of a risks uh, waiting for human beings in the future in the world. And the interesting story about this uh, graph is that, uh, as you can see, the spread of infectious disease has been listed uh, this corner, which is not so high in likelihood. And, and also the impact of this uh, spread of infectious disease has been counted a little higher than the average, but not that high. Then when it comes to this corner here, where uh, the likelihood is very high and also the impact is also very high, what you can find in this corner are, as you can see, extreme weather events or natural disasters or failure of a climate change mitigation adaptation or biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, which means that many of them are coming from um, sort of a global climate change and which means, in other words, even more serious risks than COVID will be coming to us, uh, mainly caused by the climate, global climate change in the future. So which means that, well, uh, cities in the world need to mitigate uh, or adapt to such kind of changes in the future. Now, when we talk about cooler cities, well, or in other words, how to uh, face with this kind of a reality. Well, first, in terms of mitigation, one approach we can make is to make city physically cooler, you know, simply making the cities physically cooler. That will be one of the approaches. But on the other hand, when it comes to adaptation to these um, warmer climate, I will say that make people feel cooler will be another approach that we can take. And when it comes to make cities physically cooler, that means that um, it's a sort of a story to make gray fabrics. Well, gray fabrics means that it's a fabrics uh, made out of concrete or asphalt and so on, the buildings and roads and so on. Make those green fa uh, fabrics cooler by greens. Well, that could be one of the ways that we can achieve uh, or we can face with that kind of um, the disasters. The other is that provide green cool spots to people to enjoy physically in cooler environment. And also the third one where I can nominate is that make people feel psychologically cooler by greens as well. So that uh, today I would like to uh, I like to uh, refer to three approaches which are listed here, one, two, three. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to start with the story of a make gray fabrics cooler by greens. Now, when it comes to major cities in the world, uh, many of the cities in the world are having some sort of big patch of green in the city. Uh, this is one of the examples, uh, Central Park in New York City. As you know, this uh, huge patch of green is sitting in the midst of uh, Manhattan. And of course, I know that when it comes to Bangkok, you have uh, what you call uh, green lung for Bangkok, which is called the Bangkok Chow. And, and of course, uh, when it comes to Tokyo, uh, there are several big patches, but in the heart of Tokyo, we have this huge green, which is the Imperial Palace. And whenever we talk about um, cooling down the whole city, we tend to think that, oh, 
these major green big patches will be the place which will be uh, functioning to uh, cool down the surrounding gray fabrics. But I have to say, even though that is expected, but uh, the reality is that, for example, when I take the Tokyo as an example, the temperature of Tokyo is becoming higher and higher. Here, uh, within about 130 years or so, the average temperature of Tokyo has raised about 3.5 degrees Celsius. And this 3.5 degrees Celsius increase means that if you compare the average temperature of Tokyo 130 years ago, the uh, average temperature of Tokyo was almost equivalent to the city of Sendai up north from Tokyo. But then when the temperature of Tokyo started to uh, increase, it's almost like uh, Tokyo started to travel south, like this way. And today, the temperature of uh, average temperature of Tokyo is almost equivalent to that of a uh, city of Oita, which is all the way down in south. So this means that it took about 100 years for Tokyo to come over to here. And then within 30 years, it traveled all the way down to Kyushu area within 30 years or so. So that's how the, uh, the temperature of Tokyo has been rising within these 130 years or so. And under this kind of climate, as you know, uh, this summer, Tokyo hosted Olympic Games. And uh, being one of the uh, committee members of the Olympic Committee, uh, myself, we, the experts, has been warning that, um, you know, it, don't try to have Olympic Games in summer, in midsummer, because summer Tokyo is too hot to host Olympic Games. And we have been um, uh, doing all different kinds of research works and trying to convince the organizer we have to change the season. Maybe in October, maybe in November will be ideal. But unfortunately, uh, that was not taken by um, the uh, organizing committee. And also it was not taken by the um, uh, Olympic Committee in the world. And constantly, the Olympic Games were, was held during the summer of this 2021. It was delayed for one year because of the COVID. But anyway, this summer, we hosted Olympic Games. And what happened? Well, you may have heard about this story. Uh, oops. Uh, the uh, Novak Djokovic, the uh, top tennis player, was complaining that uh, Tokyo in summer is simply too hot. And he said, we can play tennis under this kind of climate. And it was not only tennis, but also there were some, some other games where uh, players fainted or uh, got in a very um, serious uh, condition because of this uh, heat. And once again, um, before the Olympic Games was held, uh, we have been uh, measuring the air temperature of Tokyo. And uh, out of this uh, research, we have been once again, a warning the uh, committee that uh, Tokyo is not an ideal place to have Olympic Games in midsummer. One of the, uh, uh, the research we have conducted was to um, identify the air temperature, or, or air temperature and also the uh, human comfort along the marathon course, um, which was um, planned to have in Tokyo, as you can see in this map. Well, um, actually, this marathon was moved to a different city up north of Japan, which is Sapporo. But first, the plan was to have this uh, marathon in Tokyo in the midsummer during the daytime. So we measured uh, not only air temperature, but also humidity and also sun um, um, and also um, uh, wind speed and wind direction, all of those uh, microclimate. Like uh, along this uh, proposed marathon course by having uh, this kind of uh, instruments. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have been measuring temperature, humidity, solar radiation, surface temperature, airspeed, and direction, and so on. And then uh, we put all of these data into uh, the uh, formula, which is called a CONFA, uh, which has been developed by uh, Professor Robert Brown, uh, who will be giving the talk during the uh, panel discussion today. And we came up with the conclusion and how dangerous it will be to have the Olympic Games in the summer, especially the marathon. And this is the conclusion we reached. 
as you can see, um, if you'll be having this uh, marathon in midsummer and uh, during the daytime in Tokyo, then the athletes, the runners will be in the extreme danger of heat stress. That was our conclusion. So we uh, shared this data with um, committees and so on and told them that this is impossible. We should not do this and so on and on. But the interesting point of this outcome is that when you look at that this corner where the temperature, this, um, uh, the uh, number becomes the highest as a peak, this is in front of the impaired pelvis, which means that runners will be going through this area, which you, you see is somehow covered by green or right next to a massive green of impaired pelvis. But still, according to our research, our survey, we came up with the conclusion that this is a, the most dangerous part of um, the marathon. The marathon runners will be um, um, exposed to uh, extremely high temperature and also um, it's gonna be very, very dangerous for them to run through this area. So, so why? So why so hot and uncomfortable? in this area, even though it's green. Well, of course, the surface temperature of greens are significantly lower than gray fabrics, as you can see here. When it comes to green patches the, uh, in midsummer, the surface temperature of greens will be something around 30 degrees Celsius to 35 or so. But when it comes to uh, gray fabrics as um, buildings and uh, roads and so on made by concrete and asphalt, the temperature will become easily over 40 degrees. And sometimes it's gonna be like 50 or 60 degrees as well. So when you take a look at this reality, you might think that the green patches, the air in the green patches will be much, much cooler than the surrounding gray fabrics. And if this cool air will be spreading out into the gray, uh, gray fabrics, then these places might have some sort of function to cool down the city. You might think so, but the reality is, unfortunately, for example, like this one here, the cool air from green open space will be blocked by an area of buildings surrounding these greens. So even though that the cool air will be coming from the greens, but that cool air will be blocked by, by the sort of um, the wall of uh, tall buildings. So that if you want to guide those cool breeze, cool air into the green, uh, the gray fabrics, then what you should do is to, for example, greening the rooftops of the buildings, as you can see on the left, or widening the streets and have the uh, street trees along those roads. And if you can do this, well, somehow you might be able to guide the cool air into gray fabrics. And also the other thing that uh, has been uh, discussed in Japan or especially in Tokyo is that um, because the uh, cool breeze from ocean, you know, this is much cooler than the air in the gray fabrics so that uh, there has been a plan to guide this cool breeze from ocean towards the city. Like you can see here. And uh, we have a bay, Tokyo Bay down here, and uh, the cool breeze from Tokyo Bay can be guided into the green, uh, gray fabrics, as you can see. And to achieve this, for example, uh, which has been done for the Tokyo Central Station, which is sitting in the heart of Tokyo, there used to be a building like this in front of the Tokyo Station. But what, as you can see, there used to be a building like this in front of the station, and you see the station behind here. But what we have done was to torn down this building and made a twin tower on both sides, and we made it like this way so that the cool breeze will be going through the station towards the Imperial Palace. So this kind of trial has also been um, taken in some parts of Japan. Uh, including some parts of Tokyo as well. But even though that we're trying to do these uh, different kinds of a project, 
But I have to say that, well, unfortunately, cool air from green open space can reach only around 150 to 200 meters from the edge of the open spaces. And here, this uh, study has been conducted by my students and myself. And here, we measured how their temperature along the streets from the greens, oops, will be changing. And as you can see from these graphs, up until 150 meters to 200 meters, somehow it's under the influence of this green patch. But beyond that, the temperature becomes stabilized, which means that you will be no longer enjoying the cool air, which will be flowing from the green patch. So even though that you have those huge greens in the center of the city, like a central park of New York City, or uh, Bank Hotel in uh, Bangkok or in Parapals in Tokyo, even though you have that kind of huge big patch of green, but the places, the, green, uh, the gray fabrics, which will be somehow uh, enjoying that kind of cool air will be limited only about 150 to 200 meters from the edge of those greens. So, I know that some of the Chinese cities are now planning to have like this, like a jungle city. And this is one of the illustrations illustrated by uh, Italian architect whose name is uh, Stefano Borelli. And if this is something that you can achieve, then maybe, uh, yes, the whole city might become cooler by these greens. Yes, if this is possible, then that might be a wonderful story. But, um, I'm afraid that for many of the cities in the world, including Tokyo and uh, New York City and also um, uh, Bangkok as well, I'm afraid that uh, making gray fabrics cooler by the greens may not be an easy task. And uh, I'm afraid that um, many other cities in the world are, are in a kind of similar kind of situation. So, even though that, uh, yes, well, this mitigation story sounds wonderful, but uh, when it comes to the reality, well, this may not be uh, what we can achieve in the future for most of the cities in the world. So if that is the case, well, why don't we move on to the second one, to provide green cool spots to people to enjoy physically cooler environment. Well, when it, of course, you know, uh, when it comes to downtown Tokyo, we do have parks and public open spaces developed on public lands. Yes, there are. Well, even though the number of the parks are pretty much limited and much, much uh, smaller than uh, other European cities and American cities like London, Paris, New York City, so on and on, uh, our parks and public open spaces are not that enough. But still, we do have some public parks and public, uh, open spaces in, in the downtown Tokyo. But at the same time, uh, which, what characterizes um, the greens and downtowns of Japan, Japanese cities, are the green spots mostly developed by private sectors on lands owned by private sectors, which you can see on your right hand. So these are, um, may not be, you know, huge green patches. Uh, sometimes it's smaller than a thousand square meters or so on. But still uh, today, many of these um, uh, skyscrapers uh, in uh, central business districts, they're having these green patches at the foot of those skyscrapers. And I will say that yes, of these places will become a go good cool spots for people who are working in these places or simply visiting those, these places, especially during the um, mid hot summer days. And also there has been some other new trials which has been happening in Japan, including the story of this Marunouchi street park. Now this um, street, this street here, of course, this is a public street which goes through the uh, central business district of Tokyo is when the street is called Marunouchi Nakadori. And although this is a public street and it is open to the public on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but once in the year, uh, the private sector, the uh, real estate company in this area turns the street into 
something like a park. And as you can see, the lawn will be, uh, the carpet of lawn will be there. And then uh, you have benches and some trees abroad. And then you have street vendors and so on. And consequently, it will become something like a park. So that once again, this is a, um, of course, it's a public road, but this kind of a new venture has been happening in uh, many parts of uh, uh, Tokyo these days to increase uh, greens, green spots, which will become a sort of a cool spot for people who are working and also visiting these areas. Uh, Makoto, um, yep. five, five minutes to go. Huh? Okay, got it. Oh, I should be quick then. Sp and speed the other, up a little. <laughs> okay, I will do that. <laughs> and the other thing is that um, uh, application, and uh, I think that a similar kind of application will be reported by Marco, uh, Professor Marco Amati afterwards. But what we have been um, uh, developing in this area is a sort of application to guide you to a green, uh, cool spot by shaded route, which means that you will be going to those places by the, uh, the shaded route. Because we have the GIS database for topography and buildings, and also we have a GIS data for green cover, and also we have some measurement, uh, microclimate uh, measurement systems, in, which covers the downtown area of Japan. So that by connecting all of these information, the application we have developed is that that will be telling you uh, what will be the shortest route to achieve, uh, go to the green spot nearby you, or which will be the most comfortable way to reach to the uh, cool spot by going through the shaded route. So that this application will be telling you that you're here and the nearest green, green, green oasis is here. And if you take the route nearest, then take the blue one. But if you want to take the uh, maximum shaded route, then take the red one. So that kind of um, uh, application has been de being developed. And this application will be guiding you through this kind of place and take you to these uh, green spots. Okay, so finally, the third one, make people feel psychologically cooler by greens. Well, in terms of this story, let's look back the history of Japan and especially Tokyo, which was called Edo in feudal years. Edo was a city where had a, which had a very, very high population density. And the population density of Edo was about to five to six times higher than today when it comes to a citizen's neighborhood. So that it was super crowded, but, and of course it was very hot in summer, but people somehow tried to make them, themselves feel cooler by having various kinds of greens, as you can see. And every uh, summer, even today, these festivals are held so that people will be able to buy morning groceries or <clears throat> Chinese lantern fruit and hang it uh, at their window or so to make them psychologically feel cool. And this is still uh, happening in downtown Tokyo, some places. For when it comes to this downtown area, which you can see uh, from the sky, as you can see there, it looks like there's no green at all, but once you're in a neighborhood, this is what you find. And of course, you know, these greens will make you feel cooler, psychologically cooler. So uh, now I'm gonna be uh, summarizing my um, presentation. So once again, Cities in the world need to mitigate or adapt to the changes that will be waiting for us in the future. The simply the cities in the world will become hotter and hotter. And also, I have to say that cities in the world will become larger and larger simply because that urban population will be growing and growing in the future, especially when it comes to developing countries. And even the cities like Tokyo, where the population is starting to, to decrease, well, the uh, urban fabrics or gray fabrics is expanding simply because that people are demanding more rooms and more spaces. So that even though the population is decreasing, the heat island is coming larger and larger. And this graph shows that how the um, temperature has been changing in the suburbs of Tokyo. And this shows that, uh, well, simply the heat island of Tokyo is becoming larger due to the loss of greens in the suburb. So if this is a reality, once again, number one, we may not be able to take this. 
And we certainly have to focus on to uh, options number two and three. But these two and three, that means that when it comes to number two option, what we have to do is to renovate regulations to enhance joint ventures by public and private sectors to increase privately owned and uh, owned but publicly used green open spaces, as I showed you in the slide today. Or digital technologies, the applications on the cell phones will be developed to properly uh, guide people to green spots and this, that kind of uh, uh, technologies uh, or the um, um, technology should be um, given to the citizens as well to guide those people. And also when it comes to the third point, well, we have to regenerate traditional and vernacular knowledge to let them um, fit into modern lifestyles and work styles. So as far as these will be something that we have to do uh, as a conclusion, oops, I will say that uh, development develop modern uh, regulations and technologies by regenerating traditional and uh, vernacular knowledges will be something that we have to think about to make the cities cooler in our future. Well, thank you very much for your kind attention. This is it, Morelli. Yes, <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, thank you very much, Makoto. Sorry to uh, pressure you, but... Uh... It's okay. To keep my time. No problem. Uh, but I think everybody appreciates some, some very uh, good uh, comments in the chat. Everybody thinks your application is cool, which is the whole point, <laughs> right? Uh, it is indeed. Sure. <laughs> but uh, there was one quick question on uh, what has been the uptake? I mean, how many people have actually downloaded the application? Well, uh, we are still in a kind of experiment phase, and uh, it has been about uh, 2,000 to 3,000 people who downloaded this application, it, uh, mostly people who are working in that uh, central business district. But this is still in a sort of uh, experimental phase, and uh, the full version will be, a um, um, uh, I think we'll be uh, um, achieving the full version in the next summer. Okay, thank you, Makoto. Well, let us know when it uh, happens and so we can see if we can copy it into other cities. <laughs> oh, sure, definitely. Uh, there's no credit here, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much, Makoto. So now... Uh...